You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi everybody, it's wonderful to be back with you all. You are listening to me, Mighty Blue, and this show is Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. This week, as we did last week with Dixie, we're talking with somebody who shared a hike of the Appalachian Trail via YouTube. I spoke with Gretchen Pardon, or Braids, recently. Now, Braid started her YouTube channel as a response to what she saw as a need. She hadn't planned on hiking the trail at the time, but she wanted to share the information she had learned when she'd been out hiking in the Smokies. She saw that there wasn't much out there, so she went ahead and provided it herself. Braid has quite the story to tell, and I think you're going to appreciate one or two of her insights, particularly with regard to depression and anxiety. Braid will be on shortly. I spoke with Katie yesterday. She's gone home for a few days to celebrate her family birthday. So it seemed like quite a good time to get her to summarise the first third of her AT hike and the changing nature of her plans, something we all have to do during the course of a hike. If you're not adaptable, you may find that mitigates against you as the hike unfolds. Katie has certainly learned to do that, and we're going to be hearing from her after Braids. So let's hear from Braids now. Here's Gretchen Pardon, far better known as Braids. Now, I'd like you all to meet Gretchen, better known to her YouTube followers as Hiking with Braids or Braids. Hey, Gretchen, uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, Steve. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Well, and I know that you did the AT in 2020, which, as everybody knows, was <laughs> COVID year. And I'm going to get to that. But first, let's go back to how this started. It really wasn't all that long ago, was it? For Because you're, you're in your uh, early, early to mid 40s and um, you didn't really start hiking a lot until not too long ago, did you? Uh, no, I started late 2014 uh, regularly hiking. Like pr- probably I would say I was averaging going out almost every almost every weekend uh, when I was off and, and would do hikes. But why did you do that? I mean, what, 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 why did you suddenly start doing that? Um, I mean, I've always loved nature, even when I was younger as a teenager and going out occasionally and doing short little hikes with friends and stuff. But um, I got back into it really. Some friends of mine wanted to go for a hike. I went with them and just kind of fell back in love with it, started just making it more of a regular thing. I had been a runner and had been running for like about five or six years And this sort of just became kind of a new activity that I enjoyed doing even more so than the running. And shortly after I started getting kind of back into hiking, I met my, who is now my husband, and he really enjoyed hiking as well. So it just kind of became a very natural activity for us to do together on the weekends when we weren't working. And where were you hiking then? I know you live in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I live in East Tennessee, and so we were hiking most of the time in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We lived about, or I lived about 45 minutes away, so it was a really easy drive to, you know, go do a quick hike or whatever, you know, we were in the mood for as far as um, that, but it was just convenient to hike in the Smokies because it was so close. Right. So what was it then about the Smokies that held your... Was it the Smokies in particular or just hiking in general? But Because the Smokies are a pretty magical place, aren't they? Even though nearly every through hiker who goes through them thinks, oh, they, they kill me. <laughs> so what was it about the Smokies that got you? Gosh, you know, that's not, it's hard to answer because I at, at the time I started hiking again, I was pretty much hiking in the Smokies. So maybe it was a combination of the of both. I will say um, at the time I kind of had gotten into hiking again. And like I said, I met my husband in 2015 and we spent the majority of that year doing a lot of different hikes. Uh, even did our, my first backpacking trip and his first backpacking trip that year. But in 2016, the Smokies introduced the 100 
mile pin, um, you, well, basically they had different levels. So right. the more miles you did, you could get these pins. Nice. And I'm I'm a very goal oriented person, so that really <laughs> drew me in. <laughs> but uh, yes, definitely the Smoky Six is extremely beautiful, and there's so much to see. So it was an easy draw to want to go hike in the Smokies all the time, especially with it being so easy, so so convenient to drive to for me. Yeah, I'm sure. And so did he love it as much as you? Because I know that when you did your AT hike, uh, he, he wasn't with you. Uh, so did he, did he, you know, was is, is he a, is he hiking because you're hiking or he just loves hiking himself? No, I, he really did, does love hiking and he did enjoy it a lot in the beginning. But um, he is a type one diabetic. So he um, has had a few only well, really, just one time he had a pretty big issue um, right. that was a result from a backpacking trip, and I think it's kind of scared him a little as far as um, doing backpacking trips just because of his diabetes. But um, it he loves hiking, but it's he's probably not quite as passionate about it as I am. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> sure. def- yeah, you definitely are. And you mentioned the Smokies Hundred Mile Challenge and the and the pin and so on. And I, and I know that you're pretty well known for your YouTube channel, but wasn't that how you started? The reason you started doing your YouTube channel was because of that hundred mile challenge. Um, so what I was, so the YouTube channel really started because at the time it was 2017. Later, uh, the latter part of 2017, and I was working on what is called the 900 miler, and that is it's called the uh, Smoky Mountains 900 miler, and it's where you hike. All of the trails in the Great Smoke Mountains National Park, there's about 152 trails. Wow. And um, I wanted to complete that in a pretty quick time period. So I was I was doing a lot of backpacking trips. When I was planning out my backpacking trips, I was trying to find information on the different trails because a lot of the trails in the Smokies are in the backcountry. Sure. And when I was trying to do my research, I couldn't find a whole lot of information about the trails as for like visuals, you know, photographs or video, you'd find short clips. And I thought, gosh, you know, there really needs to be more uh, to me, more info on what the trails look like. I mean, I think that's important for safety purposes and planning purposes. So as I was, I was probably about halfway through my goal of completing all the trails. And that's basically when I decided that I was going to start making videos of, of my hikes. And another reason besides making it for that, for people to be able to go and find information out, out about certain trails, I have um, parents and people I know that are not really able to hike and to me, this was kind of a nice way for them to be able to feel like they were hiking too without having to be able, you know, physically be able to go on a hike. So I agree. Kind of both, yeah. I agree. The popularity of these channels is amazing. Some of them, you know, how yeah. how they almost take over people's lives. <laughs> they be, they be, they binge watch everything. And um, when you were talking, I was wondering about this. I I'd, I'd heard there were nine hundred miles of trails. I didn't know there was one hundred fifty two trails though, which is amazing to me. Mm-hmm. And I, the thought crossed my mind, does the AT go through the best part of the Smokies or are there much better trails on in the Smoky Mountains than the AT part of it? Gosh, you know, well, really, it's both. There is – the AT definitely – hits a lot of great spots of the Smokies. I mean, it sort of highlights a lot of the beauty of it. But no, there are definitely a lot of trails that are actually much, much harder. Uh, It's easy to, I think, and I will, it's funny you said earlier that a lot of thru-hikers do complain about the Smokies. I I personally don't see that, but it could be because I've hiked so much in the Smokies and I've hiked so many of the other trails in the Smokies that are a lot harder. So it's just, to me, you sort of get kind of the highlights. I mean, you're basically walking the ridge of the Smokies through yes, the AT. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And so a lot of these other trails are going down those mountains. And so you have a lot of, there's a lot of trails where you're doing bushwhacking. You've got a lot right. of steep elevation climbs, uh, wow. very rocky. Sure. So, yeah, you get it. Yeah. There's a lot, <laughs> I think, people don't realize that is in the Smokies. So you had this channel, you've met your husband, you've been hiking, 
and you've built this channel and you had some subscribers. I think you told me at the time you'd had about 2,000 subscribers before you went on the AT. Was it then a natural progression for you to do a long hike and record it for your audience or was that just for you? Well, I had, like you said, I've been doing the channel for a few years. So, yes, I mean, the desire to do the Appalachian Trail started in 2015 after I did my first backpacking trip. So oh, right. You wanted to do it that far back. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, I pretty much after we did that first backpacking trip, I already was familiar with the AT just from hiking in the Smokies and, you know, hearing about it over the years from other people and friends, things like that. So after doing that backpacking trip, that first one, I really fell in love with backpacking and just right. camping out in the woods. Sure. So the idea of doing the Appalachian Trail was just, yeah, it was kind of a natural desire for the simple fact that the thought of staying out in the woods every night for months on end <laughs> just sounded amazing. <laughs> and... um so here I was already doing my YouTube channel. So yes, when I just finally decided I was going to hike the AT, I knew I wanted to record it because I knew I wanted those memories for myself. Uh, sure. I knew from hiking all those trails in the Smokies and other trails, once you hike, it's kind of easy to start to forget the trail, forget what it looked like, oh, what yes. you experienced. So I knew if I didn't record it, that eventually those memories would fade to some degree. I agree so with you. I agree with you yeah. entirely. In fact, funnily enough, I, I, I used to, when I went in 2014, I kept um, a diary and I wrote, and that really informed my memories. But what's great about that, and you, even more for you with the video, um, when you see those things, you remember more than just what you're seeing on the video, don't you? You, you remember where you were or how, or how you felt at that time and the things that were going on around you. Yes, I think video is so good at, at, at capturing that. I mean, it's almost like you're going back in time and reliving it, whereas <laughs> photos are great, they're beautiful, but it, it just can't quite capture that that memory that you might have, that might be buried, you know, in, in a video yeah. and watching that, you sort of start to feel those same emotions that you felt absolutely before. Absolutely. So so it, that was it was important for me to record my hike, but then I also wanted to record it. My my mother and my my father, my husband, uh, friends were going to be watching, uh, would be able to follow along and and be able to watch me hike as well. And then in turn, and I'd already had people who were watching my videos prior to hiking the AT that would tell right. me, "I feel like I'm hiking with you. I feel like yes. I mean, it's so great to get to experience." this trail that I would never get to hike otherwise. And so that, that means a lot to me to hear people to, for people who aren't able to hike, but still be able to feel like they're experiencing. That's, that was always important to me. Is with well, I'm channel. glad you get that sort of message because I get that sort of message from my listeners as well, saying that our guests have encouraged people to get out there and actually start hiking, which is just yeah. amazing. So now I was one of the lucky ones, as far as I'm concerned, who went in 2019. I didn't have to think of or face COVID. Considering you'd thought about the hike for a while, why didn't you go earlier? And why was 2020 the right year for you? Well, because up until 2019, till the early part of 2019, it just had been in my head. Me and my husband had talked about it. At one point, he was even talking about maybe one day when we retire, we do it together. But as time was progressing, I could tell <laughs> he wasn't quite as enthusiastic about the backpacking as he liked it, but just not to the degree. Like I, I could just be out in the woods every weekend and he he wanted to do other things right. too so as as that time was progressing and i started really more and more thinking i really want to do this hike i guess it just it wasn't really until 2019 that i said you know it i could keep dreaming about things i want to do in my life or i can take action and just do it Damn and right. that was sort of at the point i said to my husband i really want to through hike now I don't want to wait until I retire. I mean, what if I, what if something happens and I'm not able to hike yes, then? Yes. And he's like, oh, you know, he was supportive. He said, you know, say, well, save your money up. See, I mean, save the money up. See if you could save enough to do it. And, and so I kind of, at that point in 2019 set out to plan for it. So I guess that's why I hadn't done it before then, just because yeah. it really hadn't been, 
it didn't seem like something that I could make happen like this early isn't on. That in funny? My head. Is, yeah. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny that people think they can't do it until they do it? And then yeah, they think, it, I know. Oh, it's crazy. What was, what was I concerned about? You know, it's relatively, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You have to get the money to do it because it's not cheap. But once mm-hmm. you've got the money and you've got the time, you've allocated the time, then you're away. It's only you and walking then, isn't it, really? Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I, there's been multiple things through my life that I've had different goals and would think the same thing. You know, I, I, I don't think I could do that. And then what I've realized and now having hiked through Hike the AT is I believe if if you want something bad enough, if you really want it, you can find a way to make it happen. It, even no matter how impossible it seems, I, I really believe that. I totally agree with you. But you started, and you actually started very early. I started pretty early myself in 2019. You started even earlier than me, mid-February. Why did you go so early? Because it's darn cold out in those Georgia mountains, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, it's cold. it was colder than I actually thought it would be. I, I knew it was going to be cold because I started February the 20th. But yeah. in my head, I think I thought Georgia was going to be a little warmer, but it wasn't. But, uh, yes, I'm not a fan of cold, actually, funny enough, <laughs> ironically enough. But... But I wanted to take my time on this hike. I knew that from the beginning. I knew I did not want to have to hurry. I, I'm not a fast hiker. I mean, my average pace is two miles an hour, and that is about my best. Sometimes I can get up to two and a half, but most of the time I'm averaging about two, especially with filming. And I so I knew so. I would not be able to do I, – I wasn't sure how many miles I would be able to do a day, but in my head I thought – I don't want to have to go out there and be like, I got to make miles. I want to be able to stop when I want to stop, go. I want to just be able to experience whatever I want to experience and have plenty of buffer room. So that was really the reason to start so early. Right. So you read the books, done your research, doubtless had mm-hmm. support from your YouTube fans. What were those early days like? Was it how you'd imagine it would be apart from the cold? <laughs> Um, So I knew going into it, it was going to be hard. I knew that. I I never dreamt that. I knew from my own experience of backpacking and hiking that it's not an easy thing to do. But I will say, I never, ever could have imagined just how really hard it is. And my actually my first morning on the trail, the my second day, I woke (sighs) up. I slept in the shelter. It had snowed about four inches, four or five inches the night before. (laughs) And I, here I am, someone who has been backpacking now for about four years and four or five years, and I should know better, but it was like, I don't know. I don't know if my brain just, <laughs> I almost <laughs> feel like it's the trail trying to humble you oh, really t- quickly. Every to, time, every yes, time. <laughs> but I woke up, all of my clothing was frozen. My pack was frozen. I actually had a, one of those Patagonia R1 hoodies. Mm-hmm. That I had hung up to dry because you know everything was wet from the day before because it had rained and sleeted and snowed, and it was so frozen I could hit it on the on the <laughs> shelter and it was just rock solid and I I, I couldn't fold it and I'm like what am I going to do with this thing I have to wear it it's cold I have to have something warm on so I had to put push my hands through this extremely frozen cold jacket and I'm I'm standing in the corner of the shelter. And I actually didn't put this in any of my video, but I'm standing in the corner shelter. I'm like the last person there. Everyone else is leaving. And there's one guy I think left who's kind of packing up. And I'm kind of like to myself, like in tears. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I can do this. This is really going to be hard. This is, this is going to be harder than anything I've ever done in my life. And I knew it in that moment, but I, I was determined. And so I kept going and, the funny thing is when you keep going, no matter how hard it feels in the moment and you, and when you're through hiking, it feels hard. I mean, a lot. And, but if you just keep pushing on, if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, it gets better. And then, you know, it's just, so it, the day got better and my confidence got better. And but yeah. Um, <laughs> you thought out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought out. But, it, but it's funny, but it's funny, isn't it? You know, I, I and I, I have talked about this in the past about the lack of choices on the trail. You know, you could have stayed there and been miserable, but what would that have achieved? Because you still got to get off the mountain somehow. So the only thing you can do is go forward, isn't it? Just keep going that, forward. That's true. It's it's yeah. it's funny. You know, you hear people talk about other through hikers and past through hikers talk about the trail being a metaphor for life, but it really is. Oh, it's totally. so true. I mean, if yeah. you just take your experiences 
from hiking, when you're on a through hike and you apply that to life, it really is very similar. Absolutely. Now, of course, during those early weeks, the country was starting to wake up to how serious COVID could be. And from my memory, it was mid-March when it became a bit of an issue, quite an issue, yeah. you know, when things started yeah. closing down. Was there much talk about it on the trail in those early weeks or did people just ignore it or not even know what was going on? In the very early weeks, like you said, I think it was uh, maybe early March even, maybe mid-March, something like that, because I think... It was, I, I went to a conference on the weekend of the 9th of March. So I think it was okay. the weekend, weekend after that. Okay, so... In that early time, the hikers on the trail were sort of like, well, we're on the woods. We're safe. We're This is a better place to be. I mean, thank mm-hmm. goodness we're on the trail. I mean, that was the thought. That was the sure. mindset. Yeah. That And the truth is, is when I was out there, um, even though there was a lot of hikers that started the day I started, there was about 30 hikers that started that day. So there was quite a bit of people already on the trail. Most days I hiked completely alone. Like I rarely saw people. It was not very often. Um, So I mean, I I mean, I actually hiked alone the whole time. But so for hikers out on the trail, it just seemed like we're fine out here. This is this is the better place to be. Thank goodness. And and it was, I guess, within that next week. That's when the ATC you know put out the announcement. Yeah, it and I actually, to be on the trail. And I actually watched a video of you receiving, well, you you, yeah. just, you were reporting in on receiving the news about the ATC suggestion to yeah. get off the trail. And I think you were in Hot Springs, was it? I think you were in um, Hot Springs. Well, so the, when I actually first heard the, the announcement they made, they sent it, they actually sent an email to everyone who had registered. Right. I got that when I was in the Smokies. I was actually um, oh, right, at right, right, Newfound right. Gap. And and I, my mindset was the same as all the other hikers at that point was, no, we're not a problem. We're we're better here because we're hiking alone. Most of us are hiking alone. We're not around other people. Yeah, we can do this. So yeah. I did continue forward at that point. I did continue forward and, and I went all the way through the Smokies, got, and then I got to Hot Springs. The funny thing is, is after I had finished the Smokies, and I, I might have been when I made it to Hot Springs. That's when they closed the Smokies. So it was open while I was still hiking. Yes, the you, Smokies, you, yeah. you were through there. Yeah, but from, mm-hmm. I, I got the impression from your video, you made a pretty instant decision. You you were reading about it. You read read the announcement, and now I thought you mm-hmm. decided to get straight off. So, but whenever you got it, what was the thought process? Why did you decide to get off court, or did you not believe, as you'd said before, that you were you were probably safer in the woods? than you would have been back in so-called real life? Well, deep down, I really did think I was safer out in the woods. But everything you were reading, and I'm not just that, I, I had a lot of people reaching out to me and saying, hey, you know, this, you should not be on the trail. Sure. And so sure. I guess in my heart, I thought, well, what if I'm not safe out here? And what if sure. something happened? So maybe I should get off the trail. But it, it to be a through hiker, to complete over 2000 miles of hiking in in the course of you know a continuous walk you have to have the mindset of not quitting you have to Absolutely. have that mindset and so it is extremely difficult to force yourself to say oh no I'll get off the trail now okay I'll just get off the trail yes, especially especially when for me I quit my job I quit yes. this job to do this. So, um, and I'm not young. I'm not like a fresh out of college or a, about to retire. I mean, I'm middle aged, I guess you could say. And so this was for me to make a decision to quit a job was kind of basically, I mean, I don't know, you know, you don't know what your future is going to hold from my age point, as far as it being easier to just get the same kind of work or whatever. So I took a big risk in doing what I did. Yeah, yeah so it makes to, a lot, yeah. Yeah, so to get off the trail and quit after a month, it I, it just, uh, my whole world felt like it was falling apart. I'm, and, sure, it, I'm sure it did because you mm-hmm. actually went home, I think it was March 23rd, and yes. you were off for two months. So you're actually off twice as long as you were on the trail for that first month. Yep. What was it like to go home? And did, did you think you were done or was it always in your mind that you were going to go back that year? Deep down in my heart, I wanted it. 
But I will say when I first got off the trail, well, okay, when I first got off the trail, I thought, I'll be off the trail for a couple of weeks. This will blow over. Sure, I'll get to go sure. back out. It didn't blow yeah, it over. It was getting no. worse. It was yeah. getting more. And so I am someone who has dealt with a lot of anxiety and depression over the years. And yeah. I will say getting off the trail and having to be at home, knowing I quit my job, knowing I couldn't do what I dreamt to do, to feel like, and I guess in some ways like a failure or maybe failure is not the right word, but um, to feel it's like. It's absolutely the wrong word. You're right though. Yes, you know, I, I know what you is. mean, but it's the wrong word. You're not a failure. Yeah, exactly. But well, to feel like I made a bad decision or something, you know, like why did I choose this year? to do yeah. this and and yeah. why you know it's it's almost like you're feeling sorry for yourself and it's a terrible thing to do but it's hard not to in the circumstances because when you dream about something so much and then you have that basically pulled out from under you it's hard not to think why and so i did go into a lot of it uh and back into kind of a depression um uh, not kind of i mean i was i was depressed i was depressed wow. for those two months i was wow. Um, it was hard. It was hard for my husband because I'm sure it was. Yeah. Well, well, it was for everybody, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I and and I understand that. I'm sure everyone was feeling a lot of that in their own yeah. lives, not yeah. whether they were hiking or not. So, and I tried to always keep that in my mind: is that you know everyone is struggling. I mean, people are dying. Yes. I mean, you're yes. you're you're not hiking your trail, whatever. Yeah. But um, but I will say this. <laughs> Being off the trail, I would, I, I stayed at home almost the whole time. I didn't hardly go out at all, but a few mm. times, especially getting off the trail and going home and we had stopped, I think, to get groceries or something like that. There were so many people out and it was funny. I would see on social media, all these people hiking, doing day hikes and going to these trails. And I'm like, wait a minute, do hikers can't hike, but day hikers can hike. And it's like, yes. when I was on that trail, I didn't really see anyone. So to me, I was safer. And so really what ultimately made me decide to get back out on that trail was truly the AT community. All the hostels started opening back up. Uh -huh. um, and it was as though, and I said to myself, think about all the, the entire trail and the communities along the trail. They depend on through hikers. Sure. A lot of these people were having to close their businesses because they didn't have hikers out that year. And the way I saw it is, if I mean, I'm taking a risk being at home and people are taking a risk going out to the store. I'd rather be on the trail and, and doing that and accomplishing my dream or attempting to accomplish my dream. And I knew I was gonna do it as safely as I possibly could. And that was very important to me. When I went back out on the trail, I definitely followed all the same rules that you're supposed to follow uh, that anyone else had to follow, you know, while I was on so, the trail. So, so when you went yeah. back, that was in the in May. How different did, did the trail feel? Different, or did it seem emptier? I mean, what was it like out there again? Um, I mean, it definitely was a little different, especially initially. Initially, there were, well, you know, I don't know. I say that, but really, I, I, I saw people the first day I was. I went back out. Um, I suppose in some ways, yes, the trail was definitely not as as many people like at campsites as it had yeah. been when I was yeah. first out. But there were still people out. There was still I met cool. um I met some other through hikers right after like I think the second day I was on the trail and um in some ways, quite truthfully, it 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 didn't seem I was actually surprised at how I expected when I went back out on the trail there would be no trail magic. There would be no, there would hardly be any hikers. There would be no one, you wouldn't be able to get shuttles. It'd be yeah, I, would have thought, hard. I would have thought that as well, yeah. And I never, truthfully, in that time, getting back out on that trail until I finished. I mean, it was definitely a lot less people, but there was still trail magic. I mean, actually, I got quite a bit of trail magic. I had plenty <laughs> of people <laughs> offering were, shuttles and rides. Then. <laughs> yes, I mean, so, absolutely. But, but I know because of the lost time, you decided to do a flip-flop. So the plan mm -hmm. was to do walks. I know because you had an interesting summit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your plans now you changed, uh, how you changed it about a bit. Well, I, when I went back out, I started back at Hot Springs, 
And mm-hmm. the funny thing is, that at this point, I did think to myself, I don't know if I can make it there without, you know, really trying to bust miles. And I didn't even know if I could do that with my pace. And, but I was determined. I wanted to hike northbound. I wanted to finish at Katahdin. and that's what I wanted. So I started back at Hot Springs where I got off the trail. And I hiked from Hot Springs to Grayson Highlands. And by the time I got there is when I started saying to myself, oh, I, I want to go northbound, but I just don't know what I'm going to be able to do it at this point. Sometimes, sometimes the trial won't let you, will it? Simple yeah, as that. And, and I think some, and I will say this, in some ways, it, it was also my own mental hurdle. In hindsight, I say to myself, I bet I could have probably pushed on and, and I could have done it. But I think I still mentally wanted to enjoy the trail to its fullest. I didn't want to have to skip anything I didn't want to skip. So at that point, when I got to Grayson Highlands, I thought I'm going to skip Virginia, the remainder of Virginia, uh-huh. get get to heart, get a uh, hitch a ride to heart, Harbors Ferry, yeah. and I'll keep going north from there. That way, I'll I'll, I'll finish. I'll only have to finish Virginia at the end and I can finish at Grayson Highlands. That'll be pretty cool with the ponies. Yeah. So that's, that was my, initially what I did is I skipped Virginia. That was about, I think I left there maybe the, some, at some point in June. And I don't remember now, right now the date, but yeah, I haven't sure. written down somewhere. But yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the date. So you went, so what you, so you, you were going north from Harper's. Um, mm-hmm. But you changed that as well, didn't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh-huh. I know. Uh, and like I said, this is the things that any through hiker who wants to do the trail is going to have to deal with is their own mindset and their own thoughts. And so my mindset, my thoughts were I got I had gotten to the middle part of Connecticut. It was a Falls Village. And at that point thought, I think I should flip. I don't know if I can make it to... Wow. Katahdin before they close. At this point, keep on, it was um, early July, like July the 3rd. Wow. And so I was really, I still had what, three months to yeah, yeah. make it there. Yeah. But in my head, I just thought, no, I can't make it. So I thought I'm going to flip. So, oh, and another thing was, it was very hot. It was extremely hot. New York, Connecticut had been, it was actually the um, highs in New York had been 103 degrees. So I was hiking in 103 degree weather every day through New York. And but Gretchen, you're doing, you're doing exactly what um, everybody has to do on the trail. You have to adapt yeah. to circumstances. So you, you looked at what was going on, you adapt to those circumstances and That's you went true. up and you went up to Maine. So you did your approach trail of Katahdin, <laughs> which is climbing <laughs> Katahdin. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. was that a little bit bittersweet to be doing it that way? It was. Um, so I, I, it was hard to, so I'm the kind of person because I guess I'm kind of stubborn, and which is of course one of the reasons I was able to be successful with the through hike too is yeah. having that mindset of not giving up. But um, I, it was hard to not want because I had just dreamt for years of Katahdin being that epic finish, you know. And so to know that I was, so the funny thing is the day I summited, I was ner- so nervous because in my head I'm thought I don't know if I can do this. I mean, I've only I haven't even hiked through New Hampshire or Maine or anything, yeah, and now I'm going to yeah. summit Katahdin. But when I did that, when I summited, in many ways it was what I needed because for me it helped me to see I can do this trail. Nice. I, it actually I was really excited at that point, and it it almost kind of revived a lot of the insecure thoughts I was thinking about the hike and whether I could do it and just seeing me be able to accomplish something this massive mountain and do it quite well I don't know I just I thought at that point I was like I know I can do this I know I can finish this trail so even though it wasn't my finish it was still it was still just as epic even though and I and it made me kind of think a lot about Southbounders and how they start at Katahdin sure. and they have to. Oh, I'm no, no idea how, how they can <laughs> start a Katahdin is a nightmare for me. The thought, the thought of it makes me shake, I tell you. <laughs> so you, you actually, so you, you actually did your Katahdin, did Katahdin came back South mm-hmm. and then you went mm-hmm. and eventually finished at, uh, the best Christmas present ever. You finished on December the 24th, I believe. 23rd. 23rd, 23rd yeah. In, in Grace and Harlins. I mm-hmm. bet you still felt massively accomplished once you got to that point where you knew you completed, didn't you? 
Well, you know, actually, when I finished at uh, when I finished at Grace and Highlands, it was almost it was kind of weird in the moment because it was like, oh, I'm done. Oh, I'm done. Oh, because I was know. out there. I was out there for eight months. You know, I was yeah. out there for eight months. So um, it was just almost weird, really, because of like I'd been hiking for so long that it was like, oh, it's over. And I don't know. It almost didn't feel real for a few minutes. Um, it, it did end up hitting me, and it's like, wow, I did this thing. But I would tell you something. I I know I'm not the only through hiker that thinks this because I've heard others say this. It's funny when you start the trail, you think, man, 2,000 miles, that's a lot of miles. When you start hiking, when you get about to that like 1,000 mile mark, or at least for me, I was sort of like, oh, well, I've only done a thousand, I mean, a thousand miles, that's not that much. <laughs> I mean, you, it's like your brain like starts to just thinking that the mile, miles start to seem so, I don't know, just like, I guess because you're doing so many miles, you just yes. start to, your mindset changes on what mileage looks like. So I think then, your mindset's changing the whole time. I think it really <laughs> right. is. And I said to you earlier, you, you, you are adapting to situations. And, That's true. And I, know, and I know that you've already mentioned you've had anxiety in your life. I know you want to talk about mm. this, but you said to me that um, when you finished, you apparently said that the trail didn't change me at all, but you were wrong, weren't you? It had changed yes. you quite a bit. So mm. in what ways had it changed you? And for, <sighs> actually, better than that, why did you think it hadn't? And then in what ways did it? I think it's kind of the same thing when I finished the trail. You know, when I got to that finish line, uh, or my finish line, I should say. And for that moment, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm done. Well, okay. When I got back home, it was sort of like, okay, I'm home. And I didn't necessarily, it wasn't like it was hard to go back to just the comforts of life, you know, watching TV or just sure. daily things, you know. Flushing the toilets. And <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, just, just live in everyday life. I mean, it just didn't, you hear people say, oh, it's, it's like so hard to, to transition because you've been out in the woods and, and it's that, that initial transition did not seem difficult. It just seemed like, okay, now I'm back home, whatever. But it was funny because it's like that trail got it in, gets into your, it gets into your psyche, gets into your soul. And Definitely. as the weeks went by, as a, I could just feel like this it's like part of me was left out on that trail and it's hard to explain it and it's like I've tried to talk to my husband about it and he tries his best bless his heart he tries his best to be as understanding of me and how I've been dealing with this as he can but because he hasn't done a through hike and I just think anyone who hasn't experienced that can't really fully grasp or understand that how you're your mindset no. at this point but it's like now what what's happened is whereas i didn't really think anything had changed when i got off the trail i thought oh, just same person okay whatever is where i realized is that that months of being i don't know if it's the simplicity of what you're doing of if it's just the freedom you feel inside of yourself um just nature itself i don't i'm not exactly sure what that is but whatever it is it it makes living the life you lived before just not the same it's like you want i'll find myself always just wanting to hike i find myself yeah. just constantly drawn back out to a trail and wanting that and it's funny because so i'll, I'll just reveal this I, this is not something i've actually ever revealed i wanted to hike the pct I had planned to do the AT and didn't do the PCT. But uh -huh. when I was on the trail towards the end of the hike, and I think every through hiker thinks that don't ever make any decisions when you're at the <laughs> tail end of your hike. Definitely but not. in my head, I was like, nope, nope, no more through hikes. Nope, not doing another one. No way. And I told my husband I won't do another one. And, and he was pretty happy about that because he really, it was hard for him. We had only been married three years sure. and I did this trail. Uh -huh. So, um, so I had made, kind of made that decision while I was on the trail not to do another through hike. It's been six months, and all I can do is think about doing another through hike. That's like all I can think about. And and I think that's hard on my husband because I was so adamant. I was so adamant. No, 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 I will never do it. I said hike. exactly the same thing. I, in a presentation yeah. I did nine days after I came back, I said I would never, ever, ever 
<laughs> hike again and yet it's amazing how it draws you back in and I know that oh, yeah. you still you still feel that this is post trial depression would you have done things differently to have avoided this depression and the reason I ask is that I find that the people who seem to cope with it best are those who don't slip back into their old lives precisely but always have a next project to do or something else to do to keep them occupied mm -hmm. otherwise you spend your time sitting there apparently watching tv but basically thinking you're on a mountain somewhere exactly and i will say this i feel like from that initial getting off the trail and then dealing almost i mean i, I don't want to say it's like a death because I, I don't want to say that because i feel like that's still playing something that's very significant to someone but sure. it is definitely there's definitely stages of when yeah. you get off the trail and what you go through yeah. and so i will say as someone who's had to deal with depression you know, throughout my life, um, I, I and I don't want to make that sound flippant in any way because I think dealing people who deal with depression, it's a very s serious um, condition, and it's something that is not I don't think talked about enough in a way that is not talked about negatively, and I think it's something that needs to be treated with more respect and not seen so negative to for people yeah, to definitely. to deal with because mental health issues are i mean people dealing with mental health issues there's nothing wrong with them this is just it's, it's kind of like being sick in your body you know it's just an illness yeah and so i cannot speak for anyone else as far as their own experience with post-trial depression i in some ways i feel like my de i thought my post-trial depression was just bringing back what I have dealt with through the years, just right. having depression. But like you had said, I think if you if you deal with anxiety or depression, or even if you don't, when you go out on the trail and you're doing a through hike, you have this purpose because you have that goal, you have that purpose. Yeah. And that purpose is, it fuels your, I don't know, you just, it clears your mind, it makes you feel Driven, I, I, it's hard to put into words. I guess exactly what I think in my head, but um, it made me feel. It made me feel accomplished. Actually, is what it. Yeah, did. you do. Uh, well, you do. Even if it's. Yeah. I mean, it was so hard on on that trail. But even as hard as it felt, and I mean, like in my videos, I, I share a lot of my emotions through the day, and they they vary <laughs> <do>, wildly. Yeah. <laughs> but I always felt. I never felt that depression. I never felt that emptiness that hopelessness i never yeah. felt that on the trail and so i think when you accomplish something as massive as a through hike it's it's almost like you set the bar higher for yourself yes, and you do. when you're doing you do. something that seems mundane and I, I put that in quotes um you sort of feel like you should be doing something more and I think that's where that the danger of the depression, and if that's something you're triggered by, you know, if you deal with that already in your life, if things trigger depression, or if you just deal with that constantly, and, I, and I'm not someone who deals with depression constantly, I, I would say I have what is commonly referred to like as walking depression. Um, it's something I can continue dealing with in my life. I'm a very strong person, uh -huh. and I try very hard to not allow myself to kind of let it get down um, get, get, let me get down too deep in the in the well, so to speak. But um, but there, you're just, there you're were, just aware. You're aware. You are aware. It's there. And, and yes, I think yes. awareness is probably as much as anything as the, the thing that helps you most of all to be aware. It's there and just look out for signs. I guess. Yes, but I will say, I guess as far as someone planning for the aftermath of a through hike. It's, yes. I guess it's that awareness, you know, being aware of that it will change you or it will. I can't say that. I mean, we can't obviously I can't speak for anyone else, but it did change me in many pretty ways. Much, it changes pretty much everybody. I don't think yes. anybody ever leaves the trail completely. I think it stays with them forever. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I, I wasn't sure how we'd handle this. Um, I knew we were going to talk about it, but I, you know, I, I think talking about it and recognizing it is a valuable thing for anybody when they're planning a hike to think, well, this may not be quite as easy as you think when you finish. So you, you really want to start thinking about that before you go. So, you know, I, yeah. I, I really, you know, really appreciate you allowing me to talk to you about it because I think it's something that 
people would need to need to hear because you have such a, a sunny personality normally um, when when you're on your videos and to mm-hmm. have these em- emotions you know raw emotions um, I think it's a valuable part of of the hike and and I'm just I just appreciate you coming on and talk to me about it today. Well, thank you for letting me talk about it. Um, I, I think just social media, I, I mean, it's become such a part of everyone's life yeah. and it's easy for, for social media or even YouTube things that you're doing. you you want to show the best parts and I get that, but in it, in it, and I saw this a lot during my hike and I see yeah. a lot for other people hiking and a lot of, viewers a lot of people who watch these videos they don't seem to always like to see the negative or the bad parts and i'm not sure the the psychology behind why people don't like that but it makes it difficult if you are someone who deals with with depression or anxiety or things like that where you feel like you can't share your authentic your authenticity because although to be fair be Christian, you, you have done a video about your about depression haven't you and mm-hmm. i've seen i've seen some mm-hmm. of it so you know i think it's it's valuable you've done it and i really appreciate you being open to talk to about it today and uh, thanks for coming on the show well thank you for having me i um i appreciate it okay you take it easy and we'll speak sometime soon okay thank you bye Isn't it interesting to hear that Gretchen had been hiking for hundreds of miles before she went up Katahdin, but it was that climb that made her realise that she could actually do the trail. I think that recognising these signs is an important part of your success as a hiker. For Gretchen, or Braids, she needed that tough climb to give her the confidence to get it done. And like a lot of our guests, the finish wasn't the euphoric release she'd probably imagined. She was already looking for the next high, even though she may not have been aware of it at the time. And talking about depression and anxiety, when I go on the JMT, I'm going to be devoting two consecutive episodes of the show to mental health and the benefits that hiking can bring to those who suffer from it. You'll see how it unfolds, so I'm not going to give too much of a preview, but I think that both these interviews are really going to make you think, perhaps understand more about the link between the two. Before we chat with Katie, it's thank you time once more. This week, in another great week for the show, when many of you have shown your appreciation, We've had a recurring monthly donation from our friends from Obsessed Sportswear, while individual donations from Ron Brown, Deborah Harvey, Thomas Gallagher, Curtis Fackler, Stephen Brindle, Doug Green and Joshua Swanson have really helped us out. These are actually the show's producers, so thank you deeply for that. And some people are now leaving me messages. Deborah Harvey says, Hi Mighty Blue, I've been listening to your podcast for about a year. I look forward to it every week and live vicariously through the stories the hikers share. Good luck on the JMT. (laughs) Thanks, Debbie. I think I'm going to need it. Stephen Brindle, who I met at our Woods Hole weekend last year, says, thanks for keeping the podcast going. And he signs it off, Blueberry on the AT. While Doug Green says, I've been listening for many years. (laughs) And two exclamation marks. So I thought I'd contribute at least a little. Thanks for all the efforts and great listening. Finally, Joshua Swanson says, Steve, thank you for all the great podcasts. Thanks to all of you. Remember, every little bit helps, and I've been so gratified by the way so many listeners have stepped up to ensure that the shows keep coming. If you'd like to do your bit and help produce a show, just head to hikingradionetwork.com and click on one of the many donate buttons that you're going to find there. Thanks again. So, Katie, this is the last time we'll be talking since she's at home for the rest of the week. I'm off to the JMT the following week. By the way, she's with her daughter at the moment, and you hear a bit of banging about in the house part way through. You don't have to put up with any of that on the AT, do you? Here she is. So, it's Katie again. How are you, Katie? Hey. Hi, Steve. I'm doing great. You're not doing great, though, because unusually, <laughs> unusually, unusually, we're not, you know, you're not on the trail. You're, um, I think, at your, your son-in-law and your daughter's home or something like that. Yeah. That's right. Visiting right. family for uh, several days. Just uh, we have a family birthday coming up that I did not want to miss. And the timing seemed right to I had just finished uh, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. So hopped in a car and took myself to Virginia. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure you were quite relieved, actually, in many ways. Okay, give it some up, up Pennsylvania for us. What did, what, did you, what did you think of it overall? 
I think the southern half sort of prepared me for the northern half, and I think the northern half is preparing me for New Hampshire. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a bit of an yeah. issue, by the way. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> no. Well, I the northern half of Pennsylvania was tough, and a couple of things. One, you're dealing with uh, just these little rocks that are coming out of the trail. You're, you know, constantly uh, either walking on small rocks on the trail or yeah. you're crossing rock scrambles. Yeah. So how, how did your how did your shoes hold up to to that? Because I found mine were ripped to shreds. Those shoes me. held up. Now I am getting a different pair. You know, I'm getting the same shoe, but just a new pair moving forward. So how many have you done so far then? How many pairs of shoes have you got through so far? Um, two, but the first pair, I feel like they still have some life in them. These, I feel like it's time to let them go. Right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so you're you're back you're back you're at, at someone's home now, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. Was this yeah. was this always planned, or did it just seem a good idea? Having done Pennsylvania, you thought you'd take a little break at home. Yes, yeah, it, and it's family, so you know it's nice to be around the people I love, and and um, you know just take a few days off. I'm looking forward to uh, heading back. I. I literally made myself walk to the center of the bridge uh, <laughs> at the river so that I would could mentally know that I had completed Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> so even if I have to walk it again to cross that bridge, <laughs> I, it was I wanted to get to do that. So, it's a wonderful moment. It's, it's def definitely definitely wonderful is, moment. It is. Yeah. And, and scary. And There's a lot of traffic on family. that bridge. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, and, and don't you find, by the way, when you when you cro go across the bridge, and I found this coming out of Duncan and across the Susquehanna uh, River, the bridge there, the traffic rushes past. It's so much louder than you remember in in your previous life, isn't it? Right, right, yeah. It's it's pretty. It's right there next to you, so that's pretty scary. But, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I know we mentioned that you fell last week, but. You really, mm -hmm. you really downplayed it. I can see you now, and you've got a black eye. I mean, some of the pictures <laughs> you put on Facebook, they were horrendous. How, how are you feeling? I, all I can say is I think it looks worse than it was. So I, I, did, I hit my head and my knee, and then um, – a few days later, so the head was doing fine. I had no symptoms of concussion, right. you know, no dizziness, no nausea, just my head hurt where I'd hit it. Sure. Well, in two days, I guess that had all drained and it was in my eye. It was <sighs> like a black eye. So it, it has settled I, in your eye, yeah. I, I, looked, I looked really bad, <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, so what, whatever. What, what would people say to you when they saw you? I, you know what, hikers didn't say anything. Nobody really noticed it, you know. <laughs> so I didn't notice it for a few days. So I think it just, I don't know. It's one of those things that look far more dramatic than they actually are. So it certainly did. <laughs> and, and, and kind of joking aside, I think we've said this before. When when you fall as a as a 20 year old or a 30 year old, it is different to falling as a, a 60 year old. I mean, right. did, did you find, uh, and I certainly ha I've found it myself, I found it not dispiriting, but it definitely shook my confidence when I fell yeah. quite a bit. Did it, did it do that to you or were you just well, get up and get that's on with my, it? That's my third fall. And the first two were like, they were very, you know, it was mushy and muddy and that kind of thing. So um, it did slow me down at least that day. And, and I realized part of the problem was that I really, my pack was really full. I had just resupplied, you know, had, it was heavier than typical. But I, I can tell you that, um, the thing that challenges me the most now is, and, and this is something I think I have to learn to do better, 
when I'm looking at the map before I take off in the day and I see words like wolf rocks, <laughs> I, I, I have to I have to not see that as, oh, yeah, look, that's not a big deal. I, I have to know that that's going to be uh, a big rock scramble that's going to come up in my day. So my last day out there, no, second to the last day, uh, was an 18 mile day for me well done. and it was getting to be late in the day and you know of course you're getting tired and it's almost I, I even started the day late it was almost twilight so you know and you're crossing rocks and you're already tired so you have to really you have to focus I literally just took my pack off had some water set down for a little bit and then proceeded, and and that worked, you know, to do it that way. So yeah, going at the end of a day is really can be quite unnerving, and you realise it's it's getting it's starting to get darker, and then you've got this this quite tricky climb climb ahead of you. you you're, That's you know, right. You, you're right. Leaving those things to to the end of the day is sometimes a bit dangerous. I know that when we went down down into Duncannon at the end of a twenty six mile day nightmare. Right. Uh, that that walk down in Duncannon was scary anyway. But the end of twenty five right. miles or uh, twenty six miles that was even more scary. I tell you. Yeah. 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 I have to really take care. That's right. So where are, I know you, you've got to the, the border. So what is your current total mileage? Have you worked that out? Um, it's it's almost 700. I, it's like 720 miles. So oh, about oh. A, I'm a third of the way. Nice. So, so only, yeah. two, only two thirds to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I... I my thought is, is I'm just going to continue as I'm going. And then, you know, if it looks like I expect to be able to increase my mileage a little bit more, I've, I'm up to about an average of maybe 12 to 13 miles a day Good. now. Good. So if I can increase uh, my mileage some, I, I'm just going to kind of watch, see where I get and just keep my eye on Katahdin and Maine. And uh, if necessary, I, I will have to jump up, if, yeah. you know, but if not, we'll see. Well, we see said that the goes. other day, really, you know, you, you're kind of, you, you have to adapt your hike to yes. suit the circumstances Definitely. around you, don't you? So that that's what you're doing. That's what everybody has to do when they're out there. So, yes. um, now, now you are, how long are you home for this time? Um, about four or five days. I'll leave at the end of the weekend. Okay. Well, and th th that means this is probably the last time we're going to be speaking before I, I go to the John Muir Trail because I go, I go on a week on Sunday. So yes. if you're not back on the trail. So this would be a pretty good time, I think, to summarize how this adventure has felt like so far because you've had such – a checkered hike, if you know, if you don't mind yes. me saying so. Um, oh. Yeah. What What does it feel like to you? Does it feel? Has it felt like a burden, or it just has it just felt like an ever expanding adventure? You know, I I really think it's a lot like life for me. It's just this is something that I've wanted to do for a long time. I. Of course, you know, my plan was to start and go just straight north and do it all in my six months. And and as life would have it, that plan had to change. Sure. And so um, I just am forever grateful for every day that I get to be out there. And, you know, uh, I don't let that part, the part of, of having to adapt – that doesn't discourage me. That's just, that is life. Yes, and course, for me, yeah. um, you know, I think especially I've met a lot of uh, people my age, you know, who have done, have needed to do it in a creative way. And yes. a lot of flip floppers yeah. who, you know, are, have just started back, you know, the end of June. And they're heading north, and then they're going to have to come back and, you know, head south from Harper's Ferry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so have, you, have you actually worked out, by the way, where you're actually going to finish? Assuming you get all the way up to Katahdin, what's the spot you're going to finish at? 
I am so excited about that. I So my plan will be, once I finish to Katahdin, will be to come back where I got off near Irwin, Tennessee, mm-hmm. and then walk to Rockfish Gap in Virginia. That's near Waynesboro. Yes, just for, uh, just for Shenandoah. Which is home. This is that's home for me. So I have a daughter who lives less than thirty minutes from there, and then nice. another daughter uh, down I sixty four in Richmond. So it will be. Um, so that will be the finish. It will be really exciting. That'll be the finish. So Rockfish Gap, Rock, Rockfish Gap will be the finish. So you're going to have your daughters there and family there. I so, would love that. I remember that little path. There's a nice little path actually. It's quite. It's in the in the woods. You suddenly come up and you're out and you're there's there's the the, the, the road there and so on. Um, it's a great, it's a pretty nice place to finish, and that that will feel. Yeah. You know, you've got to touch a sign somewhere, haven't you? There's somewhere it, you've got to touch right. a sign. That's right. And you're walking home. For me, it's walking home, and it's. It is different than the original plan, but I mean, really, Steve, how many of us are living yes. the original plan of our life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I was going to be a train driver. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, so, oh, yeah. so will you be making, before you go back, have you thought about, apart from your shoes, any other gear changes or are you just pretty, you're pretty happy with where you are now? Um, I'm, I'm happy with my gear. I plan to i need to treat all my clothes and my shoes with permethrin again right. it's time so i'll retreat all that um i'd like to be able to um really rethink how i can keep my calorie level up so probably from the very beginning um calories making sure that i'm yeah. Getting yes. good calories in. So, yeah, but sorry, did you not get the hike of hunger, or uh, you're just not eating um, enough generally? I I eat like crazy whenever I can, but right. but when I'm hiking, um, I feel like I'm not getting enough. So right. I want to maybe like add some supplements to my breakfast and that kind of thing. So, some people just yeah. take olive oil and pour it into their it, everything everything they eat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's, ama- so, it's amazing how many interesting culinary choices you see on the trail isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know if i mention some of it your your audience might really be Bring unhappy yeah that's right yeah oh dear good well look you know, I say, I'm hopefully, I mean, you know, I've, I've failed at this hike three t- twice already. So hopefully I'm going to be able to go the whole way this time. So I won't be back till the middle of August. So okay. when I get back, obviously you and I will contact, make contact first and I'll work out a few highlights so we can then put together a show that, you know, which incorporates what you've done in those three, three or four weeks. So all I can say to you is enjoy your rest at home. Make sure your black eye gets better. <laughs> you, you look like you've been mugged at the moment with your, with your eye. <laughs> Make sure your black eye gets better. And just when you get back, enjoy it. And um, hopefully we'll catch up um, and you'll be much further north than you are right now. All right, Steve. And good luck on the John Muir Trail. Appreciate it. Take it easy then. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. When we finished, she carried on talking to me about my hike and gave me a great pep talk. As many of you know, the altitude is a bit of a worry to me, but she stopped any negative talk and told me, as my girlfriend Dana has done many times, that I'm going to be okay and that I'll do it this time. Sometimes, you know, even those of us who've conquered other trails need a little bit of assurance. I'll see you next week. (laughs) 